I think any change in behavior, any, you know, if they're normally on the football team and they don't want to do football anymore, or they study after school and they stop doing that, just any change in behavior, I think is indicative of a child that's going downhill. Welcome to Shooting Straight with Brad and David. I'm Brad Carline, your Navajo County Attorney. And I'm David Klaus, your Navajo County Sheriff. And this month on Shooting Straight, we want to talk about teen mental health. In the last few months, we've seen a number of teens in Navajo County take their life. And we want to talk about that with our guests, Diana and Dean from Community Bridges, who help deal and help children deal with mental health issues and adults with mental health issues. And we want to get some insights from you. So first, thank you for joining us. Then please each of you take a moment to introduce yourself to our audience. So my name is Diana Martirana. I am a regional clinical director for Community Bridges, which means that I oversee all of our outpatients and our crisis mobile team. Okay, and Dean? Yeah, I'm Dean Faust, and uh, I'm the crisis manager, so uh, I oversee the crisis teams. Well, let's start out by just saying, have you guys at Community Bridges seen a rise in teen suicide and teen mental health issues? I yeah. would say absolutely. Is there anything in particular you think is driving this increase? Um, for what I've, from what I've seen, I would say definitely bullying at school. A lot of kids have, a, have issues with bullying. Um, I've also seen that the, um, when the parents aren't, I don't know why I just said that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so definitely bullying in school. When you say bullying, is it person to person or also bullying on social media? I, Go ahead, yeah, Dave. Well, the, it's not like, I won't put us all in the same category of A, but I'm just gonna do it. It's, it's not like it was. So now it's more of a bigger audience because of social media. And there's such more of an impact to the individual because it's more widespread. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the ones when you walk down the, the, the school in the hallway and somebody either doesn't like you or doing that. You're dealing with one. Yeah, knock right. the so, books out of right. your hand. Yeah, right. a personal contact. It, absolutely. Now it's more of a vast audience and, and, and it's more pressure on the person. And I would imagine with social media, even beyond the kids in the school, but the kids in the community or kids, you know, thousands if not tens of thousands that may be watching the right. bully. Well, and besides that, there's all of the schools have their own platform. What do you so mean it by gets real. So I was I was talking to a, a coworker a couple of days ago and he said he's he's got some teenagers and their school has a Facebook or a, a platform where they can all all the kids can get on there and talk and so they will start bullying on there and saying things about kids that aren't true and really getting mean and I, I don't know if it's not being monitored, but um, the, everybody so in the this school. So on like social media sites, where they? I think it's a, it's more of a school also social a school. So, school yeah. More probably yeah. a texting platform. Something uh, some some media that they can all. I'm sure it's for you know school activities yeah. or something like Obviously that. Obviously, this is not the school's not purpose of having. It's for uh, educational use and right. You know, so we know that these mental health crises are occurring, what as a parent should they be watching out for to identify when their kid might be going down with behavioral health issues? Because kids aren't always forthcoming even with parents when they're suffering from problems because it's a sign of weakness in some of their eyes. But what can a parent look for to, to know that they may need to reach out and help their child or at least initiate a discussion? I think any change in behavior, any, you know, if they're normally on the football team and they don't want to do football anymore, or they study after school and they stop doing that, just any change in behavior, I think is indicative of a child that's going downhill. Uh, Dean, I know you work with the crisis response mm -hmm. team. How long does it take them to get to that point that you have to help intervene on those things? Well, that depends, because it could be immediate depending how severe they take it. Um, normally, the, we're, I wouldn't say the, I wouldn't say like the last, but 
it gets to a certain point where crisis is called and we have to step in and get something done. So what type of things are happening that parents or other concerned people are calling out a crisis unit to help intervene? Um, you're probably the biggest in this demographic where with the teens, with the yeah. teens mm -hmm. is SI, suicidal ideations. And, and are they expressing it, are you finding to their parents or to their, their fellow students it, and friends? It's all over. It could be. Uh, it could, uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be it so, but it is so broad. It could be, it could be law enforcement that gets called. It, uh, the parent can, can uh, get them, uh, can call us as well, friends, um, extended family. So we're seeing this, you know, with we're talking about bullying that's probably leading to depression. Mm -hmm. But do you also see it in substance abuse, or do you see it with the recreational use of like these heavy narcotics and stuff? Yeah, uh, well, Diana is the guru of that. <laughs> but my what we see is that the substance is more of a, co a coping. The, so a masking. Yes, a masking more from than what they're dealing with. Absolutely. So what they're, they're feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So whatever's going on in their life, they're using a substance to mask it, cover it up, put it Not behind. feel it. Exactly. So what type of things should friends and parents look for? Because they may not come out and say, I'm going to kill myself tonight. What other triggers before they say things like that that should people watch for? I, the, the, the big thing was change, like Diana mm -hmm. brought okay. up. Uh, you're, you're seeing, and we, we've all had somebody who's closest, close to us, and you're living your daily life, and then something happens. They're totally different. They're more secluded in the room, or there's no communication, just a significant, well, it doesn't have to be significant, but a change in, in their thought process. That's you know, the biggest. I suspect, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that one of the reasons that probably teens and people as, as in general don't talk about feelings of depression is the stigma that society has attached to mental health issues. I'll tell you something I've seen recently. It's almost cool to have depression and anxiety. Well, it's changing. It's changing. Yes. For the students, for yes. the youth. Yeah. So is that cutting, good change? I mean, I don't know if it's good or bad. I, sometimes people will, like I said, cutting. That's the right. um, very, very few people actually cut and get something from it. But teens will start to do that because they've seen a, somebody else do it. They, you know, they, a girl at school has a cut on her arm and they start talking about it. Which is also something else parents and friends should look for. Yes, yes. It's easy to so miss those signs because they cover them up. They're on the top of their thighs and stomachs. And so are they like broadcasting this with... It's uh, kind of like a badge of honor. Yes. Yeah, but not personal. You always have to share it, right? But no, if they, a lot of them will share their... Um, I guess diagnosis or what's going on in their life as a badge of honor. So is this after they enter into counseling or is this just something that they're talking about before to get attention? I would say before they yeah. get into counseling because a counselor can help them process the feelings and yeah. talk about healthy coping skills. So then if somebody is articulating these things, I'm depressed, I'm cutting, is that then another sign that we should they should help them get into counseling to deal with it instead of just acknowledge they have it? Yes. I'm gonna kind of go back to mm -hmm. you, Dean. You get called out. What kind of services are you providing when you're called out on these crisis responses? Well, the, the, the easiest way I can describe it, it's kind of like paramedic for the mind. Okay. So we go to these um, calls. It's could be our lion, I guess our lion's share of calls in any of them. And we have seven counties, different counties that we oversee. Um, the hospital is probably the number one that we go to. So it's already got to a point where they um, get to the hospital. And it may not be on a uh, medical issue, but those are the hubs of pretty much every community. Um, but then we will, um, we staff, we'll, we'll, we'll assess and then we staff with clinicians that Dinah uh, is one is also oversees them all um, and then we determine level of care 
So most of the time, something like that, especially when there is a, a suicidal uh, ideations or an attempt or something like that, we send to a level one. And a level one is a, a, a hospitals that deal strictly with uh, psychological problems. And there's other levels that you can respond with that they don't need that level Absolutely. one in hospital. Yeah, we can refer to counseling, um, a, a lot of different avenues we can go, but that is, that's the top tier. So, so if you're called out and they're not a level one, but a, a, a lower level, is there follow-up you do to make sure that they get the long-term help they may need? Yeah, we do a, uh, actually there's, on two levels, we do a 24-hour follow-up call with them and to see if they're following up what, we do a thing called a safety plan um, that has some guidelines and recommendations, um, but we'll try to work, talk them in. If they hadn't made the appointment um, to an outpatient provider, then we try to talk and make sure. And sometimes we do contact the uh, outpatient that's in that area to see if they've made an appointment. And then we'll do another one in about three days. And we measure. also find if they're already enrolled with somebody, so if they're enrolled with another agency or a counselor, we reach out to that counselor and let them know, we yep. saw your client in crisis. And if they're not enrolled, is there any way to nudge them to make sure they follow through? Besides saying parents, they really need the help, make sure they get it? Oh, well, well. I mean, it's gonna be up to the parents in the end the parents have to sign all of the consents and get them there. Um, the only thing we can do is recommend that they go. What about the financial cost of getting a kid in counseling? Because I assume that could be a deterrent to some families, especially if they don't know that there's help and options available. Are there, I should say, are there help and options available? There are. There are many different programs that um, parents shouldn't have to worry about. So if, and I can only speak for the agency I work Please. for, um, we don't have a huge adolescent program in Navajo County yet. We're working on it. But if the parents call any of our other sites, we can get them enrolled with, we've got one in Maricopa County that's huge. So uh, parents never have to worry about money. We would take them in, we would do their intake, figure out what services they need and get them signed up with or without insurance. And I'm, I'm assuming that other companies do the same thing. So a strong message people should take from watching this is don't let worry about finances deter you from getting help. Absolutely. Because they'll work with you. Yes. Even on the crisis side, mm -hmm. if, if there's, let's say there's no uh, insurance and there's no access or however you look at it, if there's bare nothing, there are funds out there that covers it. Yes. So. How do you get called out? I, I, I wouldn't know how to call you. Okay. Um, well, there is a number, um, and I know you're going to ask because I didn't <laughs> bring the card. Um, but uh, Solari um, is a uh, statewide dispatch for crisis, and they have several numbers around you that... Um, we have the new 988, don't we? Yeah, that is well, too. Yeah, is that works. linked to... To the crisis. Yes, it is. Yeah, it goes so right to Solari. So that's the easiest way if they can remember 988. Yes. And if they forget 988, they can always remember 911. Yeah. And, and then dispatch can we link route you to in. Nine, yeah. Yeah. And then that goes into the, like I said, their dispatch center. And then we, we all our teams carry, a, we call it a Solari phone. I, I, <laughs> Don't know what else to call it, but um, they it comes with all the information and the dispatch information and the actually, address, phone yeah, number. I wished I had that when I was, yeah, because the MDCs were kind of fun, but um, yeah, they get and they get to respond. We we respond within. Bam, depends on how many calls are going on at the time, but we try to uh, um, get there within the hour, mm -hmm. which we're pretty good, I think. Um, I'll just boast a little bit, and I think we're at like uh, 29, our average is 29 minutes for Navajo County. Given how big our county is, yeah. that's actually really good. Yeah. Yes. And, and you've just taken over Navajo County, or all of Navajo County recently, haven't yes. you? Yes, yes, as of uh, October 1st. Yeah. So we were, before that, for uh, the uh, little over a year, we were Winslow Holbrook. Right. And uh, running up through there, and then this was October 1st. Yeah. Here. So do you have many crisis counselors or whatever who is responding? And I assume somebody's on call 24-7. 24-7, yeah. Um, we have uh, a team. Well, we have, we have two here, two in 
um, in Holbrook. The, or Winslow, I understand. That's, and that's why you can respond so quickly mm -hmm. as yeah. you have some on both halves of the yeah. county. Yes. And then we uh, sometimes uh, overflow, if it tries to get busy, we try to pull from Apache because we have a team there too. So. And on the counseling itself for teens and juveniles, are you still just I-40 or are you expanding countywide or do you even have it in Navajo County? Yet? So we have a small program in Navajo County, but it's just for the adolescents that are attending NCIS. And that's part and of the probation department yes, yes. program in Holbrook. Does, is, is CBI looking to expand their footprint in, with juveniles? Yes, I just don't have a date or a, what that looks like yet. It should be soon. And we look forward to you expanding your yeah. services. Uh, you, you've been a great partner to the criminal justice system with the adults, and I'm looking forward to the expansion with the juveniles. Yeah, Thank and I, I mean, I know this crisis response stuff is in its infancy, and you know, you guys just started, but it's been a program in the metropolitan areas, mm -hmm. and now we're seeing this in the the uh, more rural counties, and and uh, what a what a great resource for the public, but also for law enforcement mm -hmm. who used to be that, that response on that. And uh, I think we're getting a better uh, result from uh, having trained professionals working with it versus law enforcement True. personnel. And since you've taken it over countywide, I've heard a lot of good things yeah. about the responses from other law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. who are happy to, to see that handoff from them to you, right. are not even having to respond anymore right. and being able to actually handle criminal matters it's instead so important. of behavioral health. It's yeah. so important to be able to let law enforcement go do what they do and yeah. get well, get them I, into I, person. Yeah, I'm super excited about the fact that we have this that this program here yeah. that we're doing that type of thing, and we're we're kind of the we're pioneering through uh, uh, how that works in a right. rural setting. But yeah. and unfortunately, we've run out of time, and we've just scratched the surface of this discussion. It's been like quick. two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you again for joining us this month on Shooting Straight with Brad and David, and please stay tuned for this month's Most Wanted. Nicole Marie Downs has a valid and confirmed felony warrant for failure to appear on the original charge of possession of dangerous drugs and possession of drug paraphernalia. Nicole's last known address was Snowflake, Arizona. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Nicole, please call Navajo County Communications Center at 928-524-4050. Or to remain anonymous, please call WeTip at 1-800-78-CRIME.